Hi, and welcome to the Universal Awareness Radio Show. My name's Linda Jocelyn, and I'm your host for today's show. And we've got an exciting show um, that we're going to be carrying out here with Winston Shroud. What we're going to be talking about, just um, while we're waiting for um, Winston Shroud to come in, um, a lot of you who are coming into the show tonight will know of Winston Shroud. He's been involved in the movement of... Um, Educating people about the law, the financial situation, um, legalese for, mm, it's got to be about 13 years now, since 1999. So many of us um, came through that route where we listened to the hour after hour of um, Winston Shrout's lectures and seminars. Even if we weren't present with Winston, we were watching them online when we had our first introduction to the um Freeman information, you know, to, to realize our sovereignty and to be able to act that out in our lives. Um, so I feel truly honored to have um, Winston coming in um, to talk to us about this. I reckon I've got him on the line here. I really hope. Oh, Winston, and I'm on the telephone this time. Oh, brilliant. That, we should have tried that out this afternoon, shouldn't we? <laughs> oh, dear. Um, but it's so good to have you on, Winston. I've just been explaining that um, you've been a lot of people's starting um, route, if you like, the whole route of our um, introduction into the movement of, of um, learning about how to act out our own sovereignty in our world. Um, was through your lectures and seminars, even if we weren't present and, and uh, weren't meeting you firsthand, we were watching it on, on the internet. So we're very honored to have you on here talking to us about um, this great flurry on the internet um, about the One People's Public Trust. And, um, um, you know, the reason I've asked Winston on is that um, there is a great uh, number of people now who are. Um, you know, opening their minds up to the two new ways. And uh, I know that there's been something like 200,000 people on, on blog talk radio shows where they're talking about OPPT. And my reason for coming forward again and starting my show up, actually, because I had taken a, a few months off, was because I really want people to have all the information and I want it to come from somebody that we trust and that we know is going to be telling us information where they've worked with this stuff on the ground they're not just talking about putting paperwork out there they've worked with this stuff so um great big welcome to winston hi winston hello <laughs> well I, I think i haven't really filled people in a lot about the one people's trust but i know that you've had more calls than from me about it people have been um asking you about it haven't they not particularly people from the one people's public trust but um, people who have come forward and said, have you seen this? So you know a little bit about it yourself. Uh, yeah, uh, when it first uh, got on the uh, Internet and so forth, uh, you know, some people who know me asked me, have, have you seen this? What do you think about it? I said, no, I haven't, I haven't seen it at all. Let me go and take a look. And so I went and looked at some of the uh, first things that came out and so forth. And so, uh, you know, I've, Actually, I haven't been altogether that concerned about it until <laughs> until you started asking about it a little bit more. Yep. <clears throat> and so, uh, in essence, uh, you know what I've uh, uh, you know from what I've seen, you know that's actually been uh, uh, put up on the internet and so forth. Uh, you know wh what I've seen is that uh, perhaps uh, you know there's some things that could be done, perhaps to strengthen the effort. Yep. And so uh, uh perhaps that those are some of the things we can talk about today. Uh you know, people ask me, you know, is is this stuff right or is it wrong or, or just what is it? And I'm not going to say it's right or wrong, uh but my observations have have led me to think that probably there's some things that could be done to uh, strengthen that particular position. Um uh, so that, that that would be the kind of conversation that I would have about some of those things. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, for me, I was a, I was a bit like you. I didn't take any notice of it at all because I go by feeling, and I felt like it was um, there was something a bit airy fairy, as I would call about it. And it didn't, having done some of the stuff myself on the ground and been into courts, and then decided not to go in court ever again, and and to drop the fight and all sorts of things like that. I've gone through my own process. So when I looked at it, I thought this is just 
this is a, a great marketing ploy and that, and they where did they get all these people from that quick and how did they get the ratings up but i know how that happens and and it and it can be quite an illusion but what concerns me and the reason that i contacted you was that there are so many people who have taken notice of it and and we've seen numbers being banded around like 200,000 and that made me think I need to come online and talk to somebody like you about it who's going to fill in some of the missing facts on this so I'm quite happy for us to um, for you to talk about what you know for me I had to start from scratch I had no idea um, about UCC filings which is what all of this is based on this is based on UCC filings so maybe you can start us at scratch with that and, and what that actually means Okay, yeah, I can uh, uh, perhaps discuss the technology that's involved here, perhaps shed a little bit of light on what it is and what it's not. Yeah. Uh, you know, that might be helpful to people to make a decision, you know, about how far they want to go into that or if they even want to go into it at all. Uh, <clears throat> I might use a comparison, uh, you know, before I start talking about the technology, and that is uh, years ago when I was still young and able, I made my living living by being a carpenter and a welder, and so I, you know, I got to a certain level of expertise in those areas. Now, let's say, for instance, that, that someone who is not a carpenter is walking down the street, and, and there's a hammer laying there in the middle of the road, and so they go and pick up that hammer. They have it in their hand, but are they capable of going and building a house with that hammer? Uh, probably not. <laughs> mm. But on the other hand, if I'm walking down the street and I pick up a hammer, am I capable of building a house? And the answer to that is yes, you see. Yeah. So, again, you know, the tools, you know, that are available to people in, in various arenas, in this particular case, we're talking about a UCC1 financing statement. Uh, if you're just walking down the street and you pick one up, you know, can you build a program based on that on that tool? And that's the real question that people have to contemplate as they start to think about, you know, uh, you know what it is that they're going to do. So there, there's been a presentation. There's been quite a bit of excitement recently. And actually, we've been excited about this kind of thing since way back when I first started learning these things, back in 98. And so uh, that's one of the first things, certainly, that came to our attention was uh, UCC financing statements. And so at this point, uh, perhaps a lot of people are getting exposure to new tools that they did not know were available. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the question that they have to ask themselves is, what can I do with this tool? If I use it, will I successfully drive that nail or will I smash my thumb? <laughs> those I are, like that. Those yeah. are two different things. Trust me. Absolutely. <laughs> I've still got the scars to prove it. <laughs> yeah, I, I know. I mean, so many people have who've been on the ground with this stuff. Oh, sure. So l l let's talk about a uh, what a UCC financing statement is. I can give a little bit of the history of how it all came about, and then to discuss yeah, the different that'd be kinds good. of. The, uh, discuss the different kinds of financing statements and how they apply and to what circumstances they apply. So uh, as the title to the document indicates, it says UCC. Now that stands for, it's an acronym for uh, Uniform Commercial Code. <clears throat> now first off, you have to understand that the Uniform Commercial Code is private law and it is the codification of the uh, commercial laws that have existed for very many centuries. Actually, if you want to trace the whole thing back, you're going to get all the way, all the way back into Scandinavia and all kinds of places uh, with something that's called law merchant law. Law merchant law is basically substantive uh, common law of the merchants, if you want to term it that yeah. way, and it dates way, way back into history. And so as uh, circumstances changed uh, in the manner that people do commerce, especially as they started to do commerce across the oceans, you see there's a great deal of peril and danger in a sailing ship going from England to North America. And so they had to uh, figure out some way to uh, 
uh, deal with the dangers and perils of, of losing cargo at sea. And so uh, as things developed, uh, certainly by the 1800s, they had developed something that was known as negotiable instruments law. Now, the first history, of course, involving negotiable instruments was probably the Knights Templars who had uh, used the concept of gold certificates, you know, for the pilgrims that were going down into the Holy Land, uh-huh. as they thought. First IOUs, so, wasn't it? Like that, the first time there was, was it the first it note? Or, yeah, yeah, I heard it. I heard it was, but I'm not sure whether that's true either. It could but. be, but I'm just talking about the concepts here. Yeah. And so anyway, by the time we get into the 1800s, you know, when uh, uh, you know the various countries and nations were wanting to do uh, commerce across the the oceans and so forth, they developed what was known as negotiable instrument law to deal with. Uh, that kind of commerce. Now, uh, the negotiable instrument law, you know, went as far as it could and so forth. But then, then we had a change in the attitude of people in regards to what kind of money that they wanted to use. Now, you know, for the longest time, people favored the use of gold and silver. Not that they have any intrinsic value in and of themselves, but being a noble metal, they don't rust. <laughs> so, yeah. So a gold coin today is going to look the exact same the way that it did, you know, a hundred years from now. So, so gold and silver, being noble metals, were preferred, you know, as a medium of exchange uh, in commerce and so forth. But again, what happens when you have a ship full of gold that sinks to the bottom of the ocean? Now, what have you got? See, now you got a real problem because you've lost all that value. So, so the consequences of those things. Then uh, certainly negotiable instrument law came into play, and then uh, certainly since the 1930s, when the nature of money uh, was uh, seriously changed, then they had to uh, provide for uh, some rules and regulations and so forth that would assist people and countries and corporations and governments in, in doing their commerce, and so what resulted in the, uh, I think it was actually 1960s or so, uh, they, they formulated what's known as the uh, Uniform Commercial Code. And uh, at this point in our history, it's basically uh, accepted across the planet uh, in the form perhaps of international uh, commercial code. Right. So, 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 so they're trying to normalize the resolution of disputes with a code that is accepted by everyone. So that's the purpose of the Uniform Commercial Code itself. Now, one of the elements that was brought forward was the concept of a financing statement. Now, uh, a financing statement would automatically bring to your mind a relationship between at least two parties. And so the two parties that are indicated on a a financing statement is the debtor and the secured party. Right. There's there's two two parties in regards to that. So we have to look at that relationship. And so the purpose of the financing statement itself is to establish – uh, you know the the uh, uh, the agreements and so forth uh, of these parties, and perhaps even to go a bit further and to even uh, set up a, a security, you know, for the debt. Now, right. so that's that's basically. I mean, that's just good business, and so it's it's been done that way for you know for a long long time. And uh, what what most people do not know or, or have realized is that initially the UCC-1 financing statements were all in the jurisdiction of the individual state. For instance, uh, you know, where I live in the United States, uh, uh, the state, you know, where I came from, Kentucky, would have its own form for a UCC-1 uh, right. financing statement. Uh, Texas would have it. Washington would have it, and so forth. And all the and other so countries. All the other countries in the world. Absolutely. Would have, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, right. They would have something very similar to that. But it would all be yeah. under Universal Commercial Code, the UCC. 
Well, yeah, that's what that's that's yeah. the genesis of creating a form to demonstrate, you know, for the for the uh, effect of having, you know, what jurisdiction. See, you have to understand yeah. that when you get involved in contracts and so forth, it, somewhere in the contract, it has to state, you know, what jurisdiction this contract is made under and where will it be executed. Right. You see. So, so I mean, you know, the law, the law in the UK is different than it is in the United States. You know, the law is a little bit different, perhaps in uh, India. So, so, uh-huh. so we have all these contingencies that we're trying to work with, so that we can have a, a commerce flow successfully across the planet. And so, again, the purpose of the UCC was to normalize the uh, uh, jurisdictions and uh, and how things would be handled. Otherwise, right. I mean, uh, you know. I mean, if the laws were too difficult, let's say in uh, uh, in China, then nobody would do business with them. Uh-huh. Or if the law, if the laws in Argentina were so out of whack that Argentina could not do business, so so they tried to uh, normalize a thought process across the planet to facilitate the interchange of people. That's simply uh-huh. what they were trying to do. So there's nothing inherently evil, there's nothing inherently good about the Uniform Commercial Code. It's just what it is. It's so, a system. Yeah, it, it's a, you know, it's, it's a good effort that's put yep. forward. So so uh but anyway, getting back to the uh, concept of using a uh, financing statement as I had mentioned, initially each jurisdiction would have its own form of a uh, of a financing statement. Now, uh, you know, perhaps a lot of the listeners uh, have not realized that. And, uh, you know, over the years I've tried to show that multiple times. For instance, the very first UCC1 financing statement that I created and recorded. Now, in a minute here, I'm going to tell the people the difference between filing and recording because this is is an important issue. Right. Right. Anyway, the very first UCC-1 financing statement that I actually uh, recorded was on a state form, and I recorded that form in the county recorder's office. And when I took that in to record it, the, you know, the first uh, the clerk I ran into, I said, here, I, I want to record this. They looked at it and said, Take it to the lien department because right. they automatically realized that what they were looking at was in the form of a lien. So sure enough, I took it down to the lien department, and that's where I had it recorded. Now, <clears throat> so so keep that history in mind because yep. now I'm going to start talking about something known as a national form, which is entirely different than a state form. Now, <clears throat> around, uh, let's see, I think it was actually 1988, or it may have been prior to that. But anyway, uh, perhaps somewhere Winston, in the 80s. I'm, just gonna, I'm sorry, I'm just going to interrupt a sec, because I had somebody call in just now, but now I've tried to open them up and they've gone offline. But what I forgot to say is we're going to gonna have question time after each hour. We're actually going to, we've got two hours at uh, 15 minutes before the end of the first hour, we're going to have question time. And then we'll have um, question time at the end for 15 minutes as well. Because I think that was a caller who had a question, but they went offline before I could get them open up. Sorry. Yeah, we, we can't. Yeah, we, we if we try to interrupt the flow of the thought here with questions, it'll be a, a detrimental to what we're trying to do. So so we'll open up for questions you know, near the near the end of the hour, you know, on both hours. Yeah, brilliant. Okay, so so I was starting to address uh, the situation with what is known as a national form. Now, a national form is considerably different than a state form. Even though it's called a financing statement, it is considerably different. Now, the national form itself was created uh, by whomever, uh, probably somewhere in the 1980s. It seemed like 88 rings a bell with me, but I can't be sure. In any event, <clears throat> if you'll if you'll look at the national form, it does have many of the elements that the that the state forms had, 
with this exception, especially on the ones that you're looking at electronically, with the exception that they do not have a place for original signatures. Right. And and they certainly do not have a place for the signature by the debtor. In consequence of that, uh, this national form is not a lien. Repeat, is not a lien. Now, for these who don't un- who don't know what a lien is, how does that make that different? Because that's the difference between. Is that also the difference between filing and recording them? Because it hasn't got uh, a lien. Not just yet. I, I will discuss okay. what a okay. lien is. Okay. So let, me, let me get through the uh, description of the national form first, and then we come back to that. Okay. All right. So, so the national form, uh, for those of you who are uh, uh, cognizant of, of our admiralty jurisdiction that we all play around in, <clears throat> the national form would constitute a notice. Now, it may be notice of a lien that is in existence. It might be notice of a contract where there's a debt owed and so forth and so on. But but it does not create a liability. A UCC-1 national form does not create liability in anybody, including the debtor. And so, again, it's just a, a, it's a notice that there might be such a thing, but it does not express it. So, so let's discuss then the difference between filing and recording. Right. A state form is recorded. A national form is filed. Now, for those who are in the United States, I'm not quite sure exactly how it is other places, but for those in the United States, we can use that as a model, and then perhaps you can look at your situation and uh, you know and change the words around and so forth so that it fits where you're at. But a, a UCC-1 national form is filed with the Secretary of State of your state or with the Department of Commerce in the UCC-1 department. So that is where you file it. Now, and some people do it electronically, which I totally disagree with. But anyway, if if you want to uh, create and uh, and file a national form, then those are the places that you would actually take and file those things. Now, how is that different than, than recording? And uh, without going into a great deal of uh, uh, explanation, uh, recordation determines final judgment, and so so think about those, those that concept. And we don't have time to go through all the uh, the uh, thought process behind that, but recordation is entirely different than filing something. And so uh, you know everybody's got a filing cabinet in their house, you know. So you stuff papers in there, you stuff books in there, all that kind of <laughs> stuff. That, that's filing. Yep. Now, how does that create liability in, in anybody? It doesn't. However, when something is recorded, you know that determines the liability, and so so we have the, that difference between those two kinds of forms and so forth. Now, I have noticed on the the uh, 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 you know the the most recent. Uh, uh, information coming out uh, from the uh, OPPT that it appears that they are filing yeah. national forms, and and uh, you know the, the difference between a filing and a recording is is the difference between water and a good thick milkshake. Right. <laughs> There's a world of difference between those things, and so I, I just wanted to give that information in regards to uh, the concept of a financing statement so so that people would understand the difference uh, uh again uh, how much how you know what kind of purchase can you get or what kind of leverage can you get from a notice as opposed to or in comparison to a recording of a lien you see 
And so again, you know, it's the difference between uh, you know a, a glass of water and a big thick milkshake. I mean, I myself would like to have the milkshake. <laughs> Absolutely, and you know, there's a simple one here, isn't there? In comparison, in that we're all, we, most of us know that when you get a notice of a parking fine, you don't fill it, you don't do anything <laughs> with it. That's a simple one, isn't it? Because most people know that who have been involved in trying to get themselves sovereign on this planet. Is that's the first oh, sure. one you start with, and it's a notice, and then you you laugh and you kind of look at it and you think, oh my God, it just says a notice. Why have I been paying these things? Yeah, so for, for all the for all the effect it has, you might as well go ahead and, and tack it up on the uh, telephone pole. Yeah, and I mean, I just laughed when I looked at it because I thought, God, I've, I've I've filled in a few of these and paid them in the past. I never looked to see whether it was a notice or it was a a real legal document. And and as soon as you realise that, so that should make it simple for people here, <laughs> shouldn't it? Because yeah, a lot you, of people you know that the, one. Yeah. yeah, if you can understand those differences, uh, like I say, yeah. I've. Uh, I've shown the one that I had created and did way back in 2000 at my county recorders. Uh, you know, for those that would like to see an example of that, certainly I'd be happy to, uh, you know, supply you know that for your so you can look at it. Uh, at some Brilliant. point, we'll give out we'll give out my website information. Absolutely. And uh, so people, you know, if you want to see one, uh, you know, that I did, uh, then I'll be happy to you know show it to you. No big deal. Anyway. And even, you know, and Winston, you know, even just starting this and getting a half an hour in, we may need to come back to this and do another show <laughs> as well. Let's well, it's do very the possible. Two hours, but I, I think great if we're going to get the people listening to the, to a lot of facts about this, we, then then I'm certainly willing to do another show where we we tell them even more. Well, sure. Like I say, I've been I've been uh, operating as a solution in commerce now for about eight years, so it's yep. kind of hard to condense it. <laughs> yep. all that into two hours. It's uh, virtually impossible. But we'll do the best we can to give a few uh, uh, bits of information that Brilliant. can be followed up on and studied. Now, uh, you had mentioned the concept of what a lien is, yeah, and uh, perhaps I should. Uh, uh, describe that for you. As I mentioned, a national form is not a lien. A UCC one on state form is a lien. Now, so let's talk about the concept of what a lien is, because I think people, uh, you know, may in fact, you know, get a little confused with that. Uh, <clears throat> and so, so basically, uh, let me define a lien. A lien is a arrest warrant, and it is a temporary taking of the title to a thing, you see. So when we start to talk about liens, we're talking about the title to a thing. It, it does not mean the thing itself. I mean, if you want to take the thing itself, then it has to go into a levy. Right. So a lien is upon title. Levy is the seizure and permanent taking of the thing itself. So, and this is one. Of, this is one of the great confusions that a lot of people run into. Uh, you know, when they're dealing, for instance, with the mortgages, or they're dealing with automobiles, or other kinds of secured debts and parties, uh, and 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 things like that, is they, they get it mixed up uh, because they don't understand that there's a difference between the title to the thing and the title. Yep. I mean, and the thing itself. Sorry. And the thing itself, it, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So so a lien <clears throat> is a, is a, ta a temporary taking of the title. It's a transfer. It's a transfer of title. Yeah. And so so when we do a lien on something, what we've done basically is we have put a cloud on the title. So the title itself cannot be transferred unless the lien is satisfied. Now let's say, for instance, uh, let's, let's give an example of that. So let's say that, that you have a uh, an automobile. And, and you have what you think the you know the title, which is not all you have is a certificate to the title. But let's say, for instance, uh, you run over my foot and crush two of my toes, it makes me kind of mad. So I go put a lien on the automobile. 
the only thing I've done is put a lien on the title to it. Does that mean that you can't drive it around? No, you can drive it all you want to. But if you tried to sell that vehicle with that lien on it, you could not sell it until you had come and settled the lien with me, which means you're going to have to pay for my doctor bills for running over and smashing my toes. You see right. I mean? that's, that's that. Yeah, that makes that clear. I, I like that. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's just, that's just plain simple stuff, you see. And so, again, the purpose of a lien is to arrest the title to a thing. Yep. I'm not going to go and take the thing, but I'm going to deal with the title to the thing because title and the thing are two separate elements. So a lot of people say, well, I'm, I'm going to go put a lien on my house. Well, okay, go ahead and do it. What does that mean? It means that the title cannot be transferred until the lien is satisfied. Does it have anything to do with possession of the house? No. No, right. No. It's just if you decide you wanted to sell it, you wanted to transfer the title and so forth, you could not do it. In many instances, for instance, we go and put a lien on money as an example. You know, for those who have been following what's been happening internationally, with the Federal Reserve, the central banks, and so forth. And uh, uh, perhaps a lot of people have looked at uh, David Wilcox's website where he talks about financial tyranny and all these kind of things. You'll notice that there were commercial liens that were placed against the Federal Reserve banks and the central banks of Europe and Asia, which means that we're not going to go in and do a seizure but in order for that bank to transfer any funds, they have to satisfy the lien first, you see. So so we have arrested the funds within the banks so they could not transfer those funds without the lien itself being satisfied. And and then the uh you know, the party that actually holds the liens, they would have to deal with that individual. So so when we do an arrest <clears throat> We're talking about arresting the title to a thing. Right. You see. Okay. All right. Well, so let's talk about then, you know, uh, perhaps the uh, mistaken impression that people might have about a UCC1 financing statement on national form. You know, for instance, you go, you know, I got the impression, you know, just looking at some of the all things that were put on YouTube and whatnot, that that some of the people were under the uh, 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 mistaken idea that by filing their house on a UCC1 financing statement, national form, that now they had, you know, complete control of it. No, absolutely not. That that can be, you know, that's so far from the truth. You know, I mean, it's uh, unbelievable. Now, if they, that's because a again, filing, that, that's a, saying, isn't it? That's a filing, in fact. Yeah, that's a, a filing. Yeah, that's yeah, a filing yeah. of a notice that there may be a security interest in the place, but this, but it does not express any security interest, not at all. There have to be other kind of documents that would be created to express that secured interest in the property. Now, some some have used, for instance, mechanics liens and other kinds of liens to to. Uh, 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 express a secured interest, uh, for instance, in a house or something like that. And uh, I don't prefer those kinds. Those are statutory kind of things. I always like, you know, to work in the uh, private world with commercial liens. But anyway, you know, we could talk about some of that later. We, we have talked about that quite a bit yeah, yeah. over the years and whatnot. But anyway, uh, getting back to the concept, you know, that, that some may have the mistaken idea that, that by filing a UCC one financing statement, you know that they have that they have taken control of of their property, and it's not true. Don't do not make that mistake. It, it'll cause you problems down the road because you can't defend it. Now, you know, people with a lot of experience like myself could, in fact, defend that position, but it'd take a whole lot of doing to do so. But again, when you're walking down the street, you pick up a hammer and you have no carpenter experience, you can't build a house. So 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 be very careful that you do not 
uh, overestimate or over or, or or get the idea that by filing you know a UCC one financing statement on national form that you've done anything because you haven't. So so let me just get that clear right now. Well, what I mean, they're actually pe- saying is that they've that that I mean what what the OPPT are saying and I and I've got all of their stuff run off here is that through filing a UCC1 filing, they have foreclosed on the whole of the banking. Yeah, right. Because it's not just that they're saying that on one house or their house. They're actually telling the world that they have foreclosed. And I I, personally, I immediately looked up the word foreclosure. I wonder (laughs) how many other people did because I thought, well, what can that? It didn't feel right to me. But what I thought is I'm going to start looking up the words and, and go really basic here and i mean you it's impossible to foreclose i would say because foreclosure the actual word doesn't mean what they think it means you can only foreclose on something in because it's set up in a certain way can't you well you know there, there's quite a bit of uh work that you know that needs to be done to come to an understanding of foreclosure itself uh here in the united states for instance the more we investigated the more we found that, uh, for instance, if someone wants to go and purchase a house and, and they get into a mortgage contract, uh, what we found was that there was already a prior mortgage contract that was developed by the bank before you made your purchase. Right. And so before Doesn't you walked me. into the closing table, the house was already foreclosed. Yep. And so so it, it, it's one of the biggest scams that have been put on by the bank yet. And we're trying we're trying to work those things out here, but but it's a very difficult thing. Where you know, I mean, it's been it's been a dogfight now for a number of years, and I think finally we're going to win it. But my goodness gracious, you know, look how many people have been you know kicked out of homes and all kinds of things, you know, because of the frauds of the bank. Yeah. So so uh, you know, for goodness gracious, anybody listen to this. Uh, uh, broadcast or, or will listen to it. You know, don't get, don't make the mistake to think that you have foreclosed on anything by filing a UCC one financing statement. It's just not so in that manner. So, uh, uh, what what other elements uh, would you like to discuss? I see we have you know a few more minutes that we could talk before we open things up. Before for we open things up, well, well, that just so important for people to hear because I'm just looking at the document here the one people because this is what 200,000 people the other day were listening to on a radio show and they're apparently Heather herself is is receiving 100,000 um, emails a week with people who want to go forward with this and what it's what they've actually said is that they have foreclosed I'm trying to look at, at um the document here, the One People's Public Trust itself consists of every person on the planet, the planet itself and the creator. This is their paperwork. The One People's Trust trustees are a talented group of very skilled individuals, including legal professionals, who in conjunction with a positive group inside the financial system, carried out extensive investigations into the massive fraud and theft taking place. After exercising extreme prudence, the OPPT concluded that the corporations operating under the guise of the people's government and financial systems were committing treason against the people of this planet without the people's knowing, willing and intentional consent. Through a series of registrations of the being of the one people of this planet, the land, air, seas and every creation thereof and therefrom, all unlawful and illegal claims of ownership and actions of management and control by the principals, agents. Okay, 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 okay. That's what okay. Stop, written. stop, stop. I know what you're saying. Yeah, okay. Uh, right. it, it's unfortunate before they made those kind of statements or determinations that they didn't have a visit down there in Australia with Franco Collins. Right. <laughs> uh, Frank, you know, Frank would have set them straight on that. The position they're taking, even though they're making observations about wrongdoings by whomever, yeah, uh, they're not getting it straight in their mind just exactly how that's going to be resolved. And so I would suggest, you know, that they go and visit with Frank and see if he can't get them straightened out on some of those concepts because the conclusions they're reaching are based on concepts that are simply not correct. Right now, uh, so where when they're we get- saying they're foreclosed. On everything in the world, and that all it is at the moment <laughs> no, is that denial. No, that didn't happen. 
that right. didn't happen. Right. Uh, well, I didn't think it did, but I, I like it from your mouth, <laughs> Winston. I like well, you. my my question, my first question is, well, who who made you trustee of me? Uh, did I, I do that? I must admit, I must admit, I question that as well, and I I certainly. Because I'm on this planet, I, I, I don't, I don't, I don't remember giving my permission for him to be my trustee. But you know, so. I feel, the, yeah, I feel the same way about that as I did with Benjamin Fulford. Started talking about how he was negotiating what was going to happen on this planet without asking me, <laughs> and I felt the same way when he did it because I know you've been involved with the um, financial tyranny stuff with um, Keith. Is it Keith Scott and? Yeah, um, very uh -huh. other people and Keenan, but I mean Benjamin Fulford was doing the same thing. He was saying what he was um, negotiating with to have on this planet and how it was going to be. Well, and well, perhaps, was... perhaps we ought not get off onto Benjamin. Uh, let's, let's stick with the present thing here. Yeah, but uh, but uh, ag again, uh, when we come back from the answer question and answer, yeah. maybe we should go into a little bit of trust law so that people understand, and then we can talk about foreclosure as well. But but but, uh, but you know that's you're getting into some pretty deep subjects, and so but we ought to explain some of those things about trust and so forth. Now I tell you what, why don't you go ahead and you you can uh, bring questions to the board, and we'll entertain questions here perhaps for ten minutes, and then we'll go on. Yeah, we've got nobody ringing in at the moment, but you're now free to ring in or put questions in capital letters in the in the chat room here. We've got a lot of people online, Winston, but. They seem okay. to be happy to listen. There's no questions come up in the chat room. Um, but if you do want to call in now, I will open, we'll carry on talking, but I will open up your lines immediately um, for 15 minutes. And yeah, we'll questions let... only about UCC financing statements. Yeah, absolutely. That's what we've been talking about so far. So those are the questions, and I'll answer those yep. questions, but we're not going to get off you know, onto other subjects until we get no, to no. those things. Okay. Well, I'll let you carry on with foreclosure or whatever you want to talk about here. Oh, okay. We've got somebody coming in. Hang on a minute. Let me just open this one up. Hi, I'm opening up two one three four. Did you have a question? Maybe they're just listening. Some people do phone in. Uh huh. Yeah, that's They're fine. not answering. I think they're phoning in to listen. Okay, you can carry on. Maybe, maybe you can tell the people who are listening what would indicate that they actually have a question that they want to ask. Is there some mechanism they could do to, to demonstrate that? No, not until I open them up. <laughs> they have, <laughs> okay. yeah, I, got, I have to just open them up and they have to tell me. But she's kept, I think it was a lady on there. I kind of heard a murmur, but she's just kept quiet. So I must, she's okay. still open. Right. So if she wants to ask a question. Well, I think probably for the listeners, uh, maybe this is new information and it'll take a little bit of time for them to digest it, you know, so, so that they can formulate a question. Yeah. As I mentioned, you know, uh, you know, we have been working with uh, financing statements uh, certainly ever since. You know, I I learned anything at all about what we call commercial redemption, and so, like I say, I started learning these things way back in '98, '99. Uh, I was still studying, and finally, in January of 2000, I went and recorded my very first UCC one financing statement. Now, what does that tell you, folks? <laughs> that that I did a lot of investigating, yeah. You know, before I before I you know ventured out into that arena, and, and for people who are just coming upon bits and pieces of this information to go out and file a, a financing statement, this helter skelter, you know, it to my mind is incomprehensible. And so so don't be jumping into something you don't understand what you're jumping into. Now, okay, well let, let's switch uh, subjects then. Perhaps some questions on UCC uh, will come up, and we yeah. can entertain those. Uh, right, I'm going to just ah, uh, right. I've got a line I'm opening here now. This is uh, I'm o I've just um, opened up nine eight two three. Um, is there a question? And oh, now they've gone offline. Hang on, I'm just opening up another one. <laughs> Hi, did you have a question, or are you just listening? This is two one three four number. No, I think they're just listening, Winston. Carry on. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, uh, like I say, uh, you know, it, it would behoove uh, all of us. You know, I, I study these. I mean, I'm no expert, and so I study myself all the time. 
and so you know certainly for those who who lack you know uh background in this and uh, and the uh, study and so forth you know uh, please please just don't jump into the middle of this without investigation you know please don't do that because you do yourself a disservice and uh it's kind of like uh, we were kind of uh talking earlier about the excitement that's involved around you know some of these thought processes that are being put forth and mm. i have not, i have nothing against uh uh, exposing, you know, what's happened, uh, you know, uh, and, and discussing the situations and so forth. But it, but be careful. It's, uh, uh, you know, for those of us who are kind of old hands at this, who have been dealing with this, you know, for a very long time and at at the very highest levels, I might add, uh, you know, the, 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 these things come of no shock or surprise to us. And so, so we're working with that. We're dealing with it. But, you know, for someone who is... Uh, you know, just uh, barely exposed, you know, to some of these concepts and so forth. I, I compare it to what I would call a sugar high. You know, if you sit yep. down and eat a box of chocolates. <laughs> Absolutely. You're, you're going to get animated like crazy. <laughs> yeah. You'll be bouncing off the walls, but there's a crash coming. You'll crash when the sugar high wears off. You'll crash. Oh, no. So, so rather than get into that kind of a situation it would be well especially for beginners like i say i i started learning about these things in 1998 and i finally filed the ucc1 financing statement in january of 2000 holy cow yeah that's, <laughs> what, that's... what took me so long <laughs> you see the wo the woman heather who who filed for the oppt she said it took two years so that they're, they're not actually asking other people to do that filing but they're saying that because they've filed people are now able to now they everything's going to be controlled through cbacs and that people should um bond themselves this is some words that i just I, I would be horrified to join in on this one but they're asking people to um Bond on a three-month contract on a CVAC, and a CVAC oh, wow. is Creators Value Asset Centers, which are going to be all around the world. Okay. This is what well, the, well, let me ask the, the question. Who, who died and made them God? I, I, absolutely. I would say the same thing to you. Honestly, I, I mean, I cannot believe what I, I don't recall read. being in contract with any of the parties that you mentioned there. Right now, the, uh, I've got the wording here. Let just let me just this one line here. Bond. This is what I heard on the radio today. Bond with your creator, then you would not need any of the. Fi oh, right now, that's another bit that where there, there's a, a little bit of backpedaling going on there. But this is as actually I, as I recall, as I recall, Linda. Yeah. Jesus bonded the apostles to do that. Why is it that we're trying to do what Jesus bonded the apostles to do? He said, well, whatever you bind on earth would be bound in heaven. Exactly. Now, now that's going right straight to the creator. Well, CVAX is in, on all the all the breaths of everybody talking about Opt, I can tell you. And it, they said today that people need to um, get the, the, the paperwork will be out this week in order for them to bond yourself to a CVAC. And it will be a contract with contracts of three months. Now, who in their right mind is going to do that? I don't but know. I think there were... Uh, well, this is what I heard on the radio show this morning. So well, don't look for me to do it. No, no, me neither. But <laughs> people need to... Uh, you know, they need to comprehend here what they're getting into, don't they, in a, in a really big way here. Because yeah, yeah, they do. That's the next stage. So, you know, I've got, I'm just opening up another line. This is 9013. Do you have... Just yes, I have a question. Ah, uh, uh, good. Okay, who's calling? Uh, my name is Kanai. I'm calling from Hawaii. Okay. Just a short question. Uh, could Winston please explain the significance of him filing his UCC one? Like yes. Really uh -huh. shortly. In short, why did he do it, and what does it mean? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh. It, it goes with this concept. Now, this is a fundamental concept of commerce, <clears throat> and that is the registration of a thing creates the exemption from taxation. Again, registration creates the exemption. 
Now, this is another concept. You know, we, I'll spend just a short time on it, you know, to answer your question, but, but it, I, I could talk for an hour about this to explain it. For, for instance, when a baby is born or when, when a baby takes the breath of life and is actually considered to be alive, then an application is, is put in, uh, usually by the mother, for a birth, and, it, and you can spell it B-I-R-T-H, or you can spell it B-E-R-T-H, but it is a place of safe haven in commerce for the baby. It is the registration of that birth that creates the exemption from taxation. Now, that exemption is held... Oh, it was held uh, by the Federal Reserve Banks. Uh, by the way, the Federal Reserve is gone now, for those of you who don't know. But in any event, uh, it is that registration that creates the exemption from taxation. The only problem is, is that most people don't know how to use that exemption while they are alive. The, it, most of the exemptions are never even considered until someone is, is, is dead. And in the ground, and so we have probate, and so we, you know, use the exemptions and so forth. Now, what we have done with our commercial redemption process is to inform people and to show them how to use that exemption while they are yet alive. So, so to answer your question, why did I record a UCC one financing statement? It was because I was registering certain documents into the commercial registry to to secure the exemption for those items. So those items cannot be taxed. So that's the reason why I did that. So, okay, that's about as far as I can go with that question without really getting deep into it. But, uh, okay, do I have another question? We've still got the caller online, I think. If you have another question, caller, please please ask it now. No, I think we're all right, Winston. We can carry on. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let, let me discuss uh, for a moment what a trust is. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, and, and here, here's Hello. the key to... Yeah, hi. Did you have another question? Uh, this is a different caller. Oh, good. Okay. Ask your question. I, I'm talking, but I hear like feedback going. It's like I'm talking and it's repeating, and you're talking and it's repeating, so it's going back and forth. I apologize. Ah, no, we um, can't hear that say, here, so we're all right. Okay, okay, but can you guys hear me now? Yes. Uh, first, I want to thank you uh, both for having this uh, awareness uh, program on the uh, web. I really find that it's it's very informative, and and not so much of a question, but a suggestion. You know. This is where it may need to have a uniformity uh, uh, in this uh, process because you have so many different uh, ideas and minds going uh, in so many different directions. And when people want to have a uh, – they have a, a belief in this, but when mm. you have so many uh, different um, options on which way to go, it's like most people get stagnant. And can't move forward because they feel that um, one person says this, one person does that. We everybody's doing their research, but the research that we're doing is like before you even move forward, it's like okay, what is the real uh, procedure on moving from step one to step two? You know what I'm saying? It's, it's almost like a, all those folks that are out there today for them to assist you. You know, it's literally maybe hundreds and thousands of dollars. For them to assist you, I'm saying, well, why couldn't we just put together or formalize some type of educational uh, uh, workshop that people can attend virtually uh, to go at this where <clears throat> and they be graded? It's just like going to school to graduate, you know. Uh, when you go to be an accountant, okay, it's not uh, 20 different variations, variations of accounting. Yeah. Oh, you know, so I don't think that. It should be 20 different ways of becoming a secure creditor. 
So there are people like myself that actually will finance uh, people to attend uh, those workshops. And uh, if it can be done in a way where uniformity, where, <clears throat> say, all those collective minds come together and say, okay, based on uh, a, a vote of confidence, this seems to be the most prevailing uh, uh, way this particular uh, methodology <laughs> I'm not saying that's going to be the one that wins all, but at the same time, uniformity, I feel, will be an added venture uh, so that people that really want to become uh, uh, secured uh, creditors that do want to have a sense of an exemption while they're alive, you know, should have that. And, and due to the uh, the non-disclosure of this stuff, that's why I'm so passionate about this. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a service-disabled veteran, and I deal with uh, veterans uh, in America, you know, that are homeless. You know, and I was former homeless veteran. So for me to be able to give uh, some of our service people over here and a, a way to rebuild their life, you know, this is a great uh, venture to give them a positive mindset on how to, re- to get their life back on track. I'm just throwing that out there. And, yeah, and, and I, I think it's Paul, great what you're about, asking. How we can on that level. Uh, sorry, I forgot to ask your name. What was your name? Elder Jeffrey St. James, minister down here in uh, Baton Rouge. We're actually setting up a Bible college for uh, universal awareness here uh, to actually help Brilliant. people get divine uh, inspiration on getting their life in order. Brilliant, and that, that sounds wonderful. Well, you know, I would agree with you here. And, you know, when I first looked at this OPPT stuff, I really just passed it over because I knew that it, 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 wasn't, it wasn't solid enough. But, but when I started to see 200,000 people online listening to it, I contacted Winston. And why would I contact Winston? Because he's the one who taught all the people in the beginning, and also he's doing it. I didn't go to people who are talking about it. I went to somebody who's doing it. I've done lots of things myself as well, I have to say here. But I don't try and teach others because I'm not good enough you know, you at it. I've done a lot, but Winston's the man. So you've got to look at who you choose to get your research from. If you sat down for a couple of days and listened to everything you've got of uh, you know, Winston on YouTube, you'd, you'd get some idea. Do you see what I'm saying? Go to the right people who are working with this stuff, who have a history of it, who have had successes. <coughs> Winston, I'm going to pass that over to you. How do you feel okay, about yeah, that? Okay, let me jump in here. Uh, first off, let me disperse one uh, uh, delusion you have. I am not the man. I am just a man. <laughs> I a know. Man, brother. I hear you. I hear you. And I know. Uh, also being a veteran, let me say Semper Fi, and uh, and I am aware of the situations that many of the veterans are dealing with, and so I, I applaud what you're doing. <clears throat> Thank you very much. <clears throat> In any event, l- let me express a, a, a thought process. Uh, the technology that we have is uh, very much standardized. Uh, but so the question really comes up in regards to an individual who wants to utilize the technology. You know, the first question I would ask is, what is it that you want to come out of this with? And so, based on what it is that you want, then then we would formulate a uh, a program or a pattern that that you might utilize to actually accomplish that thing. And I, I have kind of uh, over the over the years kind of expressed the idea. That commerce is an art form, and is, I, I go back to the you know the same illustration I use you know because I, you know I, I'm just, I'm just a nail bender you know I mean I, I'm just a carpenter I don't have any any letters behind my name uh, behind my name but what I have found as a carpenter that I had a whole toolbox you know full of various tools that were used to do a particular thing, and so when I was confronted with a particular situation, you know, that needed to be built or fixed or whatever, I would go into my toolbox and see which particular item would best facilitate <laughs> what I was trying to accomplish. And so, again, uh, you know, I, I have found that commerce, for the most part, is not a one, two, three, four thing uh, until you determine, you know, where you're at and where you want to come out at and then we can formulate steps in between that would facilitate that. 
So uh, uh, in, in regards to, you know, the various uh, things that come out from the various sources and so forth, just realize, you know, that they're looking at what's going on in their life. They're looking at what they want to accomplish, and hopefully they have the tools that they need to get there. And, but, but see, what we're expressing here is that it appears, and I'm not passing judgment, you know, on, on the efforts that other people make. But, but you know, there are certain things which have, which have come up which would indicate to me that probably there are better ways to do that thing which would, which would give a better result. And so, so that's my position. I, I'm not here to say that old PPT or, or anybody on the planet that's doing anything to try to help the situation is wrong. Mm-hmm. All I'm saying is, is that, you know, could I contribute something to them? that would facilitate what they're trying to do. And so so that's why I'm here. That's why we're having this conversation and so forth. And so so we're trying to, uh, to, to broadcast or express to people that, yeah, hey, you know, uh, we, you know, we see what's going on. I mean, it, it don't take it don't take a you know. I mean, hey, Ray Charles could see this, and he was blind. <laughs> and so we see all these problems that go on, all that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. And so what we're trying to do, everybody, you know, a lot of people. Are trying to find some way to resolve the problem for the better for the betterment of mankind. So, so that's what we're doing. May I continue with my uh, suggestions? Well, we have to be careful now because we're starting to get uh, into the next hour, and we need to move forward a little bit. Uh, could, could you hold it until the end of the next period, and then the, perhaps oh, bring some of those issues up? Most definitely. It, it, well, well, thank okay. you very much. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, that would be brilliant. And I've just got somebody else open here, and I wonder if they've got a question quick. I've, I've got 0059. Happy short, yeah. Yeah, this is uh, this is Mike from Houston. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can. Welcome. Uh, hi, Winston. I've been uh, wanting to talk to you for quite some time. I admire you, and, and uh, I've, I've seen a lot of the things that you've done with A for V and UCC1. Sure, and great. Other uh-huh. financial solutions. Um I uh, I wanted to see if you thought there was any value with, uh, you know, I I really admire what OPPT is trying to do. Uh, yeah, I yeah. Did, and I was skeptical a little bit about, uh, you know, some possible flaws that I saw, but I would I would uh, appeal to you. Are, is there any um, any actual use for the uh, courtesy notice? Uh, have you looked over the documents? Have you seen what was filed with uh, the Hague and, Okay, okay, now listen, listen, now you answered your own question. What did you call that document? The courtesy notice. Did you hear what you just said? Yes, sir. It's a notice. Okay, go from there. <laughs> I'm yeah, playing with I, you now, I, but you see my point. Yeah, a notice is actually an offer, isn't it? No, it's just a notice. Okay. Notifying. <laughs> they just simply tell somebody. You might, you might as well call them on the phone and tell it to them. It has no legal effect. It's a notice. Okay. Now, and that's a whole what? lot different than me sending out a cease and desist now, isn't it? Yes, sir, it is. Sure it so, is. So a notice is just that. It's a notice. What would be what would be the solution in, in commerce for public debt? Well, that's what I've spent the last eight years explaining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hey, listen, I'm not trying to put you off. I'm just saying, you know, I I, I don't know that I could formulate an answer that would adequ- adequately answer that question. It, it's just it's just too involved. Sure. So, uh, so if if you've been studying these things, I think probably you have many of the solutions already within your toolbox. Yes, sir. I was I was mainly asking so that people could listen and and hear your opinion on it. And um, uh, really, what I'm what I'm looking forward to is, uh, if nothing else, OPPT is getting the word out there that there's uh, yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. impropriety. We've that talked about that right. together, actually. That's the good thing about it. But now we need to get down to the nitty-gritty of what would work and what won't work. That's that's the whole point here, not people... And, and try to warn people not to yeah. endanger themselves by jumping Absolutely. before they look. Right, and I would implore you, Winston, uh, to, to work with... Uh, this, this movement, it's such a movement, uh, 
and I know they'll have to ask me. Knowledge. They'll have to ask me. I, I don't stick my nose into anybody's business unless I'm asked okay. to do so. Sure. Sure. Yeah. It'd be very impolite of me to do so. So uh, yeah. yes, it would. Uh, thank you so much for what you do, Winston. I do follow you quite a bit. I I think I've got all of your videos. Uh, Holy and, cow! Uh, <laughs> yeah, You're brainwashed. Quite a while. Yeah, <laughs> I'm definitely programmed. But uh, well, that's good stuff. <laughs> it's good it's, to have uh, an addiction to something good. <laughs> right. Right. Well, uh, I look forward to seeing what uh, what we're what what's going to come out of this OPPT, and uh, okay. hopefully, hopefully that uh, you know at least the the wave has started and people are becoming uh, aware that there's uh, you know impropriety here. Great, great. But don't sign anything or join up to anything until you've researched it for yourself with people That's who right. know what they're talking about. Because honestly, this is the only reason I ran the show is I'm concerned about the people who are signing CVAX and joining this and joining that and, and stopping. I heard somebody today who's stopping paying his um, credit, uh, what is it called, a credit union, um, and doing all things like that without knowing what, what they're getting into, thinking that everything's over as it's been told to them by OPPT. And this is the shame of it, is that it isn't all over. It hasn't all been sorted. Okay, well, let's go ahead. Let's go ahead yeah, and go along go with the program now because yeah, we're yeah, kind of uh, sure. we're starting thank to kind you. of editorialize it. Yeah, you're welcome and uh, appreciate your call. Thank you for the calls. Yeah, thank you. Sure. Okay, Linda, let me launch into a little bit of discussion here on yeah. uh, about trust because it's an important concept and uh, perhaps you know not readily understood because you know when, when you when you when you use the word trust especially as it involves an organization or something like that, then there are certain implications, you know, that you have to realize that are being made, you know, by that word. So basically, uh, the bottom line thought process is this. It is that any time that there is risk involved, then you're involved in a trust situation. So anytime there is risk, then there's a trust. Now it may be a, it may be an implied trust, it may be a constructive trust, it may be a sesta K V trust, it may be a uh, uh, an express trust. Now let me get some names uh, of some individuals who have put out some wonderful information on trust and trust law, and then the people can go and research that. I am not an expert on trust. I know a little bit, which I'll share with you, but some of these others have done a masterful job. Uh, uh, go to uh, Franco Collins, to his website. I think it's called, what, oneheaven.org or something like that. Right. And, and, and learn about the uh, history of the Sesta KV uh, trust that have been created certainly since the uh, – uh, 14th, uh, 13th, 14th century, and so forth. And then uh, you might want to go and investigate uh, the uh, Sesta K V Act of 1666 uh, from King whatever his name was there in England. Right. Which, which by the way, has been updated uh, as late as 1948. And so, so we use that Sesta, we use that Sesta K V Act in many of the things that we're uh, doing. Uh, uh, right here in the United States or actually all over the planet. So the SESTA KV Act of 1666 is an important concept, something to study. So so go and study, uh, go, you know, go and look at what uh, Frank has done, done a masterful job. Then there's another individual down in Florida, a fellow named Christian Walter. And uh, I think I think you can still find his information online. And anyway, uh, uh, Christian did a, a marvelous job of research, and uh, explaining, you know, many of these concepts on trust, you know, that we're working with. So uh, go, go and read those things and study them. But in my own uh, <laughs> uh, way, let me explain uh, a little bit about trust, the structure of them, and the functions thereof. Uh, as I mentioned, anytime there's a risk involved, in other words, when the outcome is uncertain, then we're getting involved in risk. We're getting involved in the trust situation. 
And so, so the question gets to be, in whom shall we trust? Now, here in the United States, you hear a phrase, in God we trust, and people use that phrase all the time, but I'm, I'm kind of doubtful <laughs> that they're really doing that. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> we have these situations, you know, that we try to deal with. So, yeah. so so let's talk about the concept, uh, first off, just to get it kicked off with the concept of a SESTA-KV trust. Now, the the best example here in the United States and probably in the United Kingdom and other places, the best example of a SESTA-KV trust is uh, our Social Security system. That right. is a perfect example of a SESTA-KV. And there are things that can be done with that. Uh, for instance, a while back I put out a, a DVD on how to indenture that Social Security trust to turn it into an express trust which is altogether different than a SESTA-KV. See, a SESTA-KV is operated uh, solely for the benefit of, of what, what you might call a beneficiary. I don't know if you really truly be a beneficiary, but, for instance, the government operates Social Security system for the benefit of well, Elizabeth II. Oh, Really? <laughs> oh, yes. So the Queen of England owns the Social Security system here in the United States, and it's operated as a SESTA-KV, and she's a beneficiary of it. Oh, <laughs> a lot of people didn't know that. No, All right, I'm so, sure. So that, that's an example of a SESTA-KV. Now, <clears throat> there are also what would be implied or constructive trust. Now, for instance, uh, uh, the, the government, you know, our governments are continually in, uh, entangling us in constructive trust or implied trust. Uh, as an example, you we were kind of joking a little bit earlier about a traffic ticket. Yeah. A, tra a traffic ticket is an implied trust because, again, what's the problem? The outcome is uncertain. <laughs> so there's risk yeah. involved. So, so that would be another example that a lot of people are familiar with uh, of an implied or a constructive trust. And when you go into court, uh, you're in a trust situation. And and so all these things that we involve ourselves with uh, are, are because there's risk involved in their trust. For instance, our, our monetary system, the Federal Reserve notes, that we use, bank checks that we use, credit cards, and all of our monetary system, the outcome is uncertain. So there's risk involved, you see. So everything we're doing technically is under a trust situation. All right, so, so let's talk about an express trust. Now, an express trust has a certain structure to it. It, it has uh, the, the fundamental part. Is the creator or the grantor of the trust? In other words, that's the party that, is, that decided, hey, let's formalize this risk into an express trust. So the grantor or the creator of the trust is, is technically in, in relationship to that trust. They're God. They're the creator. Okay. Now, there are certain uh, other foundational elements that must exist in that trust in order for there to be a trust. Number one, there has to be some asset in the trust. Now, the party who brings the value or the asset to the trust is the settler. Now, the settler may or may not be the creator. They may or may not be the grantor. They don't have to be. In other words, somebody can set up a trust and somebody else can bring the value into the trust. But but that value is what's known as the trust corpus or the body of the trust. And without that value there, there is not any trust. Matter of fact, if you, even if you have a trust running and you take all the value out, out of it, the trust collapses. So the, the probably the most powerful a party in any trust is the settler because <clears throat> one of the first laws or maxims of trust is that the intent of the settler is the law of the trust. 
Okay, somebody's talking. Somebody, somebody, uh, somebody needs to mute out. I can hear you talking. Okay, so so for everybody's online or whatever, you know, or if you're on the phone, maybe you can mute. You know, so yeah. I don't hear you uh, agreeing with me. I mean, I'm, I'm happy you agree with me, but <laughs> <laughs> it kind of, it kind of uh, over talks so other people uh, can hear it. Anyway, all right. So let, let me let me restate that. The intent of the settler is the law of the trust. And all the settler has to do is to express his intent. And that becomes the law of the trust. Now, that doesn't, you know, uh, and so so as we talk down about the other elements of the trust, you know, then that is key to understand. And that's what I was trying to indicate with that a social security trust indenture is for the party who brought value into that trust and who is the part who is the only party who's made any contributions to it is the party who in fact you know has been making payments into that trust so they're the settler they're the settler and once they express their intent then that becomes the law of that trust regardless of what the queen thinks so when you look at OPPT one people's public trust They've set a trust up, but is that a real trust in the legal I don't terms? Know. That, that would, would, I'm just going to mute these people because I'm getting funny noises. Um, would you, um, would you, would you have to register a trust then, Winston, to make it legal and binding? They brought the asset into it. Now probably sorry, they are I con- you, sorry, you're gonna to have to repeat that. I've muted everybody and I muted you as well. Sorry about that. Oh. You're okay. open again now. <laughs> well, in, in regards to any trust. Right. Uh, whether it be the OP uh, OPPT or, or whatever. Yeah. <clears throat> the settler is the party that brings the asset to the trust. And so perhaps they are conceptualizing that all of the contributions made by the people on the planet is, in fact, the asset of the trust. But I have to ask the question, at what point did the settlers, the people on the planet, bring those assets into OPPT? Or, yeah, OPPT, right. yeah. And so so that's a real question because, again, uh, uh you know, it, it sounds like that, that some of the uh, organizers or grantors or creators of that trust are trying to get uh, the settlers into a contract. They are. Some kind of bond or something like that. And I just don't know how that's going to work out. Uh, and it really ain't in my business. But uh, what I'm saying is that, generally speaking, the settler who brings the asset to the trust is the most powerful party within that trust, and they get to establish the trust indenture, which is, in fact, the law of that trust, how the assets will be handled. So we should be saying to the people who are joining the trust, ask questions. Find out before you join or sign. Oh, I or, I mean, what, yeah. How would you okay. want to commit an asset to something you don't know, have any idea what it is? Right. That don't so make they any need, sense to me. No, that's good. That's good. I mean, so, if people across the planet have assets they want to you know, get rid of, hey, call me up. <laughs> I need... I, <laughs> I, I need a new vehicle. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, well, okay. this is the whole point of the program is, is people, you need to be asking questions. You need to be not going along with something that you know nothing about. And I certainly didn't know anything about how this trust was set up. And this is why I'm asking, Winston, and you should be asking the same questions and actually asking the people who set the trust up. Yeah. Now, back to the structure of a of, a, of an express trust itself. Uh, so we have the grantor and the creator. We've defined the what and who the settler of the trust is. We have identified the trust corpus, which is the asset. So now let's talk about the intent of the settler. What does the settler want done with the asset? And so, so the settler creates the trust indenture as to how the assets are, are to be dispersed or invested or what's to be done with the assets. Now, 
Uh, aside from those parties to a trust, there are also two other parties that are key to it, and that is the trustee and the beneficiary. Now, the, the trustee is the party who is basically the executive officer in that trust. In other words, they're the go-to guy. They're the guys that get things done. I mean, they're, they're the ones that disperse funds. They're the ones that deal with the liabilities of the trust and all the kind of things. So, so a trustee is an essential part of a trust, but the trustee cannot be the creator or the settler because right. if if the if the ass if if the if both sides of the equation are vested in the same party, then the trust collapses. So, so the settler and, and the creator and so forth need to determine who they will choose to act in the capacity as the trustee and certainly if you're going to choose a trustee it had better be somebody that you trust <laughs> <laughs> i'm not yeah so, <laughs> absolutely okay now the other party that's involved in this trust setup is the beneficiary now it, it is for the beneficiary that the trust was created in the first place now it is it is a a possible that the creator and the settler could actually be the beneficiaries of that trust. They can't be the trustee, but they can be the beneficiary. And many times that's exactly what's done. Now, the beneficiary is the party for whom the trust indenture was created to facilitate something. For instance, uh, many parents set up a family trust and so, you know, when when the child gets to be 18, you know, they get, you know, their college tuition mm. paid. Or when they get to be 25, you know, they get the, you know, whatever, you know, wh whatever the asset of the trust is. And then through the trust indenture, those things are administered by the trustee. And there's other situations that are set up. Uh, for instance, uh, let's say some somebody, you know, has, has had a, a business all their life. They've run a company. They get old and they say, well, you know, uh, my child is only 10 years old, and so I can't really pass on the business to a 10-year-old. So they say, what I'll do is I'll create a trust. I'll put the business into the trust so that when the child grows up and demonstrates uh, 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 you know, capability to run the business, then, then the business would be passed to them and the, and the trust would collapse. So there's all kinds of things, you know, ways the trust can be used. I know a lot of people use the trust uh, situation to avoid probate. And so so we have all these things that the trust could be successfully used for uh, and, and, and to a good effect. But now, so, so let's talk about the difference between the trustee and the beneficiary because this is going to give you some ideas, again, about some of the things that we've talked about in regards to uh, title mm. and possession. Remember we talked about the difference between a title to a thing and the possession of the thing. Yeah. And so if, if people want to go and study that a little bit further, if you go to the Uniform Commercial Code to the revised Article 9, it it will talk to you about you know creating a perfected security interest and there's certain things that have to be done to perfect that interest but because it has to do with the difference between title and possession and so again we had talked about you know a lien which is a transfer of title versus a levy which which is a permanent taking of the thing so, so we get into this same thought process when we start to refer to a trustee right. versus a beneficiary. You will find that the trustee has the legal title to the trust corpus. The trustee has the responsibility to the legal title to the trust corpus. The beneficiary... The beneficiary has the equitable title, or what we would call possessory title, to the trust corpus. And, and so you, you see, automatically see the difference between the two. 
Now it mm-hmm. should be obvious. <clears throat> and we have an old phrase, you know, that we've practically worn out over the years, which simply says the possession is nine tenths of the law. The law, yeah. Okay. All right. So in a trust situation, you you see that from the trustee position that he has one tenth responsibility. And the beneficiary has the other nine tenths. Which would you rather be? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know I, I, mean? I, I, and I'm confused <laughs> with. Um, I mean, there's a lot of information there, but with the um, one people's public trust, I'm just wondering what people think they are. Are they trustees or beneficiaries? Then well, no, nor do I. My trustee. No, no, I never joined up, so I'm not either. But I wonder if all those people <laughs> who have know what they are. But, um, well, Winston, I don't I even know who wanted... they are. How am I going to trust them? I know. And, and I mean, uh, <laughs> w- what I wanted to remind you of is, is I know you wanted to address, because we're, de- we're on the, the one and a half hours now, so we've got another 15 minutes before we can open the lines. Up. We've got two people waiting, to, uh, hopefully, to ask questions. They're, they're certainly online. But we've got uh-huh. another 15 minutes, and I wondered if you wanted to address the $2 billion, which now I see has gone up to $5 billion on some of the the radio programs that that people are sitting there waiting for. No wonder they joined up to the trust because they've been told that <laughs> as soon as the CVAC and the CVAC is the Creators Value Asset Center, which is being formulated and all the paperwork is being done by the trust, as soon as that goes online, then their account will be opened up with the two billion or five billion, whatever it is. What does it matter if you're being told one billion or five? Um, it, let me put it this way: If that were allowed to be to happen, it would destroy the people who receive those funds. Trust me. Yeah. You, you cannot carry that much debt. No. It's all debt currency. Do you want to have you know the, well, the burden yeah, of a hundred dollars, or do you want to have the burden of a billion? I am so glad you said that because this it, it is will what de- I it will destroy people. Why in the world would, would we wantonly go out and try to destroy people? I mean, that's that's completely out of line. Yeah. It, it, first it, off, so, where, where are those billions coming from? And how would it be delivered? It'd be a lot of gold if they're going <laughs> to say it's gold. How are you going to get that delivered to your door? I mean, I don't. I've heard that recently, though, Winston. This is how crazy this whole thing is. Is that people are are thinking it. something? I I um, we can go more into that. But you you just saying there that that's just totally impossible and ridiculous. Yeah. Good. <laughs> I don't. I um, mean, I, I don't know who, who conceived that idea. I mean, I've I've heard those kind of things, you know, spoken before. Uh, well, think about it this way: if if everybody had a billion dollars, who'd go to work tomorrow? Yeah. Who you know who who'd run the who'd run the electricity, you know, who who'd staff the hospitals, who'd pump the gas. I mean, it's ludicrous. And so it's all, I mean, it really I don't need, it doesn't really need a whole lot of conversation. I got No, I I don't think it does either, <laughs> but I have heard radio shows talking about how that they, how they're going to sort that one out. But um something else that's been said that concerned me greatly when I heard it said on a radio show within the last 2 days that everybody gets their social security checks still until CVAC comes online and then your account's opened up with the two billion. Well, I, would, they're, they're, I yeah. mean, my goodness, that's dangerous stuff to say to people, isn't it? That your your, your checks are going to stop, your pensions are all going to stop because it's all over, and then you're going to be on CVACs with your account for two billion open. I mean, well, I just think. Let me tell it this way: I, I do, I am involved in the real world in the international finances. Yeah, and, and it, it what's being proposed here is not going to happen. Yeah, not going to happen. If, if they think for some reason that they're going to get into the Saint Germain Trust, you know that's a pipe dream. It's not going to happen that way. No, I'm not. I don't know whether I've heard them talk about uh, the, the OPP team about that. Or, I don't think they have. They think they're getting this money. I from. don't know, and but nobody's asking the questions, Winston. On every one of their shows, <laughs> there's just a lot of sugar high. I can tell you because I've listened to them to educate myself on so that I could start to run some real awareness programs on it and get the right people in because I I'm, I feel like we need to take care of 200,000 people who are running with this. <laughs> well, I have no responsibility to the 200,000. I know. I know. A- any more than I have the responsibility to the rest of mankind. And so so I do try to, you know, impart as much 
knowledge, you know, has has been given to me. But you know, from my position in, in the uh, uh, my association with people uh, planetary in in the, in those in those uh, upper realms and, and levels and so forth. I mean, the idea that two billion dollars is going to be put in somebody's bank account is, is completely ludicrous. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I just so, like people to hear that, and they've heard it from not just me, but from you. So that's really well, good. Well, first off, you have to ask the question: Why would you want something you didn't work for? <laughs> well, give me a, a break here. Yeah, I mean, I, you, know, I, you know, when I was able, I was, you know, I was, I was working as a carpenter, and, and I, what I earned is what I used. And now I'm in the education business, and what I, you know, what I receive, you know, from my labors, I use it. But don't come over, come over to my house and say, "Hey, I'll give you two billion dollars if you go out here and do this, or, or do nothing at all." That is well, completely immoral. <laughs> well, I, I think that it's possible to not want to work in the normal world, and I and I see that. But I, for me, I I think, um, and probably you with all the work you do with these seminars, I don't see what I do. I don't see this program as work. So I see it as me on my blueprint, me enjoying myself, me sharing knowledge with people, helping other well, come, people come to, to share walk their my knowledge. Shoes you know? for a few miles, and you'll find out it is work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you've been all over the place with yours. Um, I, you know. Um, um, but um, I just think um, the bit about, um, I don't know, I, I don't totally agree with that, that things shouldn't come for free, but the, the two billion is ludicrous. I mean, it really is. And um, there's another piece about, uh, I was just having a look here. You, I mean, you were talking about your involvement with the international world, and, and you have actually been involved with the um, financial tyranny case that David... Wilcox talks about a lot and has Correct. a lot on his uh, site, haven't you? So you are involved with the actual real closing down or hopefully eventually to close down the old banking system. Yes, to some extent. I, I've had my input where I had something to you know to share. So yeah. I, so I have. Uh-huh. And that's um, commercial liens and, and all sorts of things like that, is it? It could be, yeah. There's other things too. I mean, you know, when, when you get into the international you know the value yeah. of one trillion is a small number. Yeah. But but who 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 at my level or your level or you know the common guy on the street uh, even conceptualizes of a trillion? No, I know. So so when you, when you get into those levels, when the people are actually dealing with those kinds of numbers, it, it's a whole different world. And I so, mean, most uh, people would be grateful for a hundred pounds put in their pocket. Well, how, 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 yeah, you have to think: how, how much does it take to run the world tomorrow? Yeah. You know, is a trillion is a trillion a good number? Or is it ten trillion? Yeah. And so, so the people who are operating with those numbers, you know, they they have a different perspective perhaps than we do. And so, but but they still, you know, they still all put their pants on one leg at a time, like I do. They, they, they it, all it just, still breathe the same breath. I always think we still all breathe that it. same That's air. You saying, know, you know I, absolutely. I, you know, I, I, I have seen, you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I have knowledge of, for instance, a hundred trillion dollar trade. Yep. Now, what did I get out of that? Nothing. No. See, but so what was the what was all those numbers created for? Is for the benefit of the planet, so we can function in commerce and so forth. Yeah. And please don't come give me a billion dollars. I have no use for a billion dollars. Well, no, me neither. What in the hell am I going to do with it? <laughs> well, I think I mean, this get, is get the real. sugar hype. This is the sugar hype, isn't it? Oh, Shall yeah, we? It uh, we've got. We got twenty. We got twenty minutes, and we got a lot of callers coming online. Shall I open some of these up and see what questions? What to, yeah, got? whatever you like. Yeah, to do. let's I'm have a go on that. Okay. Yeah. No, I've just opened nine eight two three. Nine eight two three. Testing one two. Yeah, I can hear somebody. Hi, have you got a question? Yes, can you hear me? Hello. Yeah, I can hear you. We got a lot of feedback, but I can also hear you. We'll go with you at the moment. I'm just going to mute other people off so we can get a good. Right. Okay. You're 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 open now. We'll go with you at the moment. I'm just going to mute other people off so we can get a good line on it. Hi. Oh no, he's gone off now. I'm opening up another one. This is proving complicated here. Hi. Who's calling? I'm opening up five six eight six. 
do you have a question? Not one on there. Okay, let's close that one off. We might still be able to just talk. I've got a lot of people online. I'm just going to check. Hi, this is. Um, I'm opening up nine one five one. Do you have a question for Winston? Yes. Uh, I'd like to thank him for you know the study material that he's given me over the years. He's been very successful with his and Jack's uh, work. Uh, Great. Many friends have talked about uh, OPPT and. Uh, come to the same conclusion that it was more or less meaningless but we've more or less moved along to a state and learning how to remove our state so called from the suffocate by system and trying to contemplate how it's still possible to keep the corporation or the straw man to still function inside of commerce without uh, violating or jumping jurisdictions uh, give me an example. Well, it, it, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Tammy uh, Pepperman, but uh, she's basically yeah, I'll talk uh, to Tammy. Re- reclaiming the house and the estate back, uh, you know, into their original home, so to speak. And by doing that, you're, in essence, expatriating completely. Now, she doesn't advocate the transversing back into uh, the commercial realm, which I've had plenty of success with, uh, thanks to you and Jack Smith on that, but, uh, I'm, you know, I'm just trying to find out and kind of working a little bit with Jack and uh, uh, just trying to find out how, how we can maintain by crushing the suffocate by, but yet maintain that entity, because after all, the, the, the corporate entity was created from our estates. Everybody, well, a lot of people like to look at it that the, the straw man is theirs. But I like to look at it as the only reason that they ever had any control over it is because we've abandoned control. And uh, so that's Okay, that's let, let me address a few of those things. And, and this might be a real good discussion for me to have uh, so everybody can hear it. Mm. Uh, so, so go ahead, uh, Linda, and uh, mute everybody out. Now, let me address these particular things that this gentleman yeah, brought up because it's uh, it's very valuable. Uh, Good. You know the the things that he's talked about here. So let me know when I'm ready. Yeah, you're. I've muted everybody oh, okay. out. All right. Yeah. All right. Uh, first off, as he mentioned, what's called the straw man. That is a trust, but you are not the creator of it. You are not the creator of it. In most cases, for most people who have not become enlightened, uh, it is being operated as a Sesta KV, Sesta KV trust. And so, so as we spoke about trust indentures and doing some of those kind of things, you can turn that trust into an express trust because you, as the only contributor to that trust, are in fact the settler. Now, now, we have used this in many instances, uh, especially when people go into court. Now, people get all confused in court. You know, they have, uh, you know, they, they, they come in uh, and, and respond, or they might even argue that they're not de- the defendant. That's not the question. The real question in regards to a court situation is who is the surety for the defendant? And because you signed that SS5 form and did not express that trust, then you are construed to be the surety slash trustee for that straw man trust. But it's not your trust. You didn't create it, but you can express it as the settler and change the nature of how that trust operates. So, So that's an important concept, you know, that's been brought up here. Now, in regards to estate, uh, because the application for the uh, uh, birth uh, was registered, it created what's basically called a foreign situs trust. And then what happened was the state, the state where you were born, created the straw man on what is called the birth certificate. The birth certificate is not a birth certificate. It is a death death certificate. It, it, it is the first assumption that is made that you are deceased. And because we don't go back and rebut the assumption, 
then they act upon it as it, as it is a as a presumption. So so certainly one of the things, you know, just flat out, one of the one of the main things that I put on my UCC one financing statement on state forms in 2000 was that birth certificate, so that right. I could take control of it, and so I did that. But in any event, what, what is being done <clears throat> through the pledge system? Through the pledge system, what has happened is is that they have hypothecated your future labor. In other words, <clears throat> they did some you know studies you know uh, you know using the uh, life insurance actuarial uh, tables and so forth and determined how long a normal person or or normal man or woman would be productive in their life. And so they set a value to that, and then based upon that value, then they went and created bonds and all that kind of stuff through the DTC, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what they did was they hypothecated on your future labor. So what they did in essence was was they put your estate into debt. And so then you're expected to work your whole life to redeem that debt. So so that's that that's the hook they have into you. And, and folks, it's not slavery; it's involuntary servitude. That's what's yeah. happening here. And so, anyway, we get into these situations, and so what we've done uh, o- over the years is, is to try to learn how to deal with uh, the the uh, the theft of our estate, which is being done by what is known. Uh, certainly, the IRS uh, has. Uh, Define this, but your your estate is being thieved by qualified heirs. Now you need to go study the concept of a qualified heir and just how they're doing that thing. So, so the question gets to be, what can be done to stop the theft of the estate by the qualified heirs? And by those parties that show up on Form 56, the IRS Form 56, you know, <laughs> that's a long story, too. But anyway, let's talk more about the solution to to that problem. Certainly one of the first things that might be valuable is the trust indenture of that SESTA KV uh, Social Security Trust. That would be a real good way to go to get some of these things stopped. But there's also another element here that I want to discuss, and I have done. Uh, I have made presentation of this information. Uh, see, I think there's a. Uh, I think I did a single topic DVD. Let me go ahead and announce it. You know, se- several of you have said you know that you've seen my information. Perhaps some of the others haven't. If you want to go to my website, which is Winston Shroud Solutions in Commerce dot com, or just type in WSSIC dot com, that's the website. And when you get to that website, you want to you might want to investigate uh, a, a single topic DVD that I had done in regards to affidavit of life. Now, <clears throat> uh, the concept is based on uh, abandonment, and that is if you go back anciently, you know when the when the sailors jumped aboard a ship and they sailed off to the end of the world and fell off the end. <laughs> Uh-huh. Or anyway, when, when they disappeared over the horizon, they had no way to communicate. In other words, you know, you know, short of a carrier pigeon, you know, that's the only way they had, and that that wouldn't go very far. So anyway, when somebody left on a ship and they weren't heard from for a period of time, uh, certainly after seven years with no communication, they they were determined to be dead. Now, now, what is the significance of that? The significance is the following: it is that their estate had to be administered. Let's say, for instance, a sailor had a house, so he sailed off, wasn't heard from for seven years. So now you have a vacant house sitting in the community with nobody living in it, or, or, or it may be crops, or it might be a farm, or it might be animals, and all these kind of things. So the community had to had to make some decision about how to administer this property in the absence of a of an individual who was presumed dead. 
So, so that's what they did. I mean, they had to do something about it. I mean, if a house stays va- vacant for very long, I mean, first thing you know, you mean the place deteriorates. It's an eyesore in the community. It's a fire trap. Who, who knows what might happen? You see, and so the community had to do something about that, and they did. And, and so, so various uh, parties, you know, e- either either official or non-official, would start to administer the estate because they had to. Now, let's suppose that that sailor who had sailed away was shipwrecked, and and and, and he didn't die. I mean, he saved himself, but it was let's say you know eight years later he was able to get a ship and come back to his original. Uh, uh, place that he had embarked from so he comes back and he finds that you know that somebody else is in his house somebody else is you know running his farm you know and somebody so you see what happens here so so the question gets to be does that individual have a a a a rightful claim upon that estate and the answer is yes so provisions were made that if some party were assumed dead, but then it was proven that they were yet alive, that they could reclaim their assets or their estate on request or upon application or upon uh, <laughs> upon doing certain things. So, so what we have done, or what I've done, and I've done these kind of things too. Is is that that we have uh, put together a process to overcome the assumption of death? Now, as I had mentioned, uh, you know, uh, immediately or shortly thereafter, a baby is born. A death certificate is issued, called the birth certificate. The birth certificate is a tombstone. If you don't believe me, look at the birth certificate. Take it out to the uh, cemetery, and you'll see that the name of the individual. It is styled in the exact same manner. So the birth certificate can be looked at as a tombstone. So so the birth certificate is a death certificate, which is the assumption of death because nobody comes and says anything different about it. Now, a, a baby certainly, you know, is not capable of going and dealing with that. The mother could, perhaps the father could, but the baby is incapable of doing that. So that's why we call them a ward of the state. And the, and the state don't do anything about it either because they're in the business of stealing the asset uh, <laughs> as it yeah. goes. So so, uh, so w- w- when the baby reaches the age of majority, which is legally determined to be 18 years, the baby, who is now an 18-year-old, could very well come and reestablish his claim to the estate. And so the question is, how would he do that? So what we did, uh, what I've done here, is to put together a process for for doing that. And it's, it's embodied in what I call an affidavit of life. Now, the elements of the affidavit of life are are very, very simple, and I don't need to you know go through all those things in detail. But anyway, uh, uh, with this affidavit, we apply a blood thumbprint. Right. I mean, we actually prick our thumb. We stick a blood thumbprint in the document because only a living man or woman, only a living entity can produce a blood thumbprint. Now, isn't that so? Of course it is. Yeah. So... So and then on our affidavit we do not use a notary public we use witnesses. Right. If if you look in the scriptures you know it says that every word shall be established out of the mouth of two or three witnesses. So at least two, preferably three, and these witnesses are simply going to attest to we've known, you know, uh we've known Winston you know, for the last you know ten or twenty or fifteen years or whatever, and we do know that he has been alive all that time, and we do know that he is presently alive. <laughs> that, that's good. Now, Winston. I'm just going to say we've got six minutes. Can you just quickly tell people the benefits of doing that, taking back your yeah. drawman? Yeah. Now, or what? Some, somebody had mentioned Tammy. 
Yeah. Uh, Tammy, Tammy takes it a bit further, and I think her position is very, very correct. She says what you need to do with such documents as that is you need to take them and get them into the public record. Now, yep. it would be preferable that you could put them into the county recorder's office if you can get it there. If not, then you could introduce it into a court case as evidence and then you could get certified copies back from that. So so there are ways to, to deal with that. Now, I will say the justification for that affidavit comes from Corpus Juris Secundum uh, in the section on, uh, on death where it states that if someone has been presumed dead and yet has found that they're alive, that all previous administrations of their estate are void. Right. And that's the exact same thing that it says in the Sesta K V Act of sixteen sixty six. So so we have a good foundation uh, upon which to, which to base this process and so forth. So again, okay, yeah, we're kinda of running out on time and so forth. I know. Maybe we're gonna we'll... need to do another show, aren't we? We'll definitely organize that. But quickly, are, what are the benefits for doing the process you just said? Benefits in this life. Going going back and reclaiming all the things that have been stolen from you. Right. So from it's that point on, recoupment. yeah, you so can go back and sue for the. If they won't give it back to you voluntarily, go and sue and get it from them. So that's anything you may have paid out in any way. Yeah, like a promissory note on a mortgage. Yeah, yeah, okay. That's no, no. I just wanted to make that clear to people because I wasn't totally clear myself. But this has been brilliant, Winston, because you've given a lot of people a lot of food for thought here on actually doing the the, the process themselves. I've got somebody who's who's just come in. Let's just see if they've got a quick question. Hi, I've just opened up nine eight two three. Have you a question, or are you just listening? Yes. Can you? Um Ask Winston about the uh, Federal Reserve being shut down. Right. Do you yeah, know I heard that the... question? Yeah, I heard that question. Uh, yes. Let me let me just briefly state that the uh, Federal Reserve Bank operated under a charter. That charter ran out and it was not renewed. Yeah. Now the function of the Federal Reserve uh, has been assumed by the uh, U.S. Treasury. Notice I did not say the U.S. Department of Treasury. I said the U.S. Treasury. See what what Keith and some of the, some of the ones you know realize is, is the only way that we can get any kind of uh, sovereignty back into the nations and so forth is a strong national treasury and nationalization of the central banks. Yes. And so so that's the effort that's being uh, put forward. And so when when the Fed charter run out, they just simply said, well, okay, we're not going to renew it. So what does that mean <laughs> to the people? Because what does that mean, Winston? The, the, okay, it hasn't been renewed. What does that mean? Is there any change? Well, the uh, the, the, what, what, what will eventually happen is is that we will have a national currency. People don't realize the Federal Reserve notes are international currency. We're the yeah. only country on the planet that doesn't have its own currency. I mean, the British have got their pounds, the Germans have got their Deutsch and all this kind of stuff, but the United States uh, of America does not have its own existing currency. So at some point, there will have to be established a national currency for the use and be, to be issued by the U.S. Treasury, not by a central bank. So, 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 so then the currency that we have will have real value and not just a fictional value because our, our currency will be affixed to the labor of the people where it should be. Go back to your colonial times. Look, at, you know, study the colonial script, and you'll see how that works. Yeah. So we're kind of out of time with a lot of those things. We are. But, you know. Winston, this has been great. I've really enjoyed that. I've learned a lot here, and I hope everybody else has. We've certainly had a – I mean, we've had 72 in the chat room, but I know when I look at the stats, we've had hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people live online. So, um, oh, great. Yeah, it's been great, and, and we must follow up. I'll contact you, but thank you again. I'm going to pl- have to play us out because we've got like one minute, I think, left. But um, I hope you've enjoyed it too, Winston. Yeah, just uh, you know, if folks have questions, if you go to the to my website, it's www.wssic.com. Correct. So please go and check out all his stuff, um, and um, get educated. <laughs> yeah, just, just remember, say... I'm, I'm not talking for the heck of it, folks. What we have to offer is something that could be of value to you. Absolutely. It, you know, this is stuff that is working out there now. I'm going to play us out and um, namaste to everyone and thank you, Winston. <laughs> <laughs>